I said 12.03, but we'll sneak in a couple of uh, minutes early. Uh, welcome to this uh, information event for, uh, about writing a master thesis. Uh, for those of you don't, uh, who don't know who I am, I'm uh, Grund Jomos. I'm uh, the head of studies for civil engineering. Along with me, uh, I have uh, Christian Rönne, who's the head of studies for uh, building design, uh, you know, architectural engineering. And we also have our study administrator, Marianne Gorde, uh, who I hope you know who is, because she is actually the one that can help you with a lot of things that you ask Christian and me about. So uh, she sits at the uh, first floor uh, of uh, building uh, 118. And uh, a lot, a lot of the questions that you have uh, on basic questions, she's actually the one that knows that better than Christian and me, because she's also in more close contact with us uh, with uh, regards to those uh, uh, nitty gritty details of, uh, of the running and operations on your daily uh, studies. Uh, but what we're here for today is that I'm going to give a presentation uh, about uh, research and project writing. There's going to be some general uh, information about writing techniques, uh, how research techniques. And then there's also going to be some practical information about the details of registering, uh, running and doing the project, finishing the project and so on and so forth. Uh, some of the constraints that is associated with that. Uh, we are recording this uh, so that, uh, and the slides will be available uh, afterwards. Uh, so that you can benefit from that, hopefully, uh, later on. Uh, so, what is writing a thesis? Well, as this clever guy said, the only difference between science and screwing around is writing it down. So you'll have to write, you'll have to possibly screw around a bit, but also at some point it's the writing of the thesis that matters, and it's the thesis that you're going to be evaluated on. Uh, and that's a very key thing is that, uh, which we'll get back to, but it is the document that decides. So if you're doing overwhelmingly amount of work in the lab and don't find time to write it, that's not what the external reviewer can see. So, uh, you know, defend your time and make it, make sure that all your work is written down. So, if we start uh, and imagine a circle that contains all of human knowledge, uh, at some point you have a little information, you grow up, finish high school, you get some more, you get a bachelor's degree, which most of you have here, uh, unless you're about to start uh, the uh, master's next year, you get some more specialized information uh, your studies will give you more and more. You take technological specialization, you get very uh, more and more focus. And then you get into reading research papers and you're at the edge of the boundary. You read a paper that was published in April 2015 and somebody is really just at the edge. And then your job is to then focus in, push and work and make a dent in that. You have to come up with something that is new something that people have not done before. And that is a result. You need to have a result because without a thesis, and without a result, a thesis uh, becomes very difficult to write. And for you, this is what it looks like. You talk to all of your friends, boyfriend, girlfriend, family members, all know that you're writing a thesis and it's the whole world but it's also important to keep in mind that there's a lot of other things going on and that you're, we're only a mere little part of this whole uh, existence of knowledge. All of this is based on, uh, on Matt Might, uh, who did a, a, you know, the PhD school. And in the end, what we want to do is to knowledge to save lives or knowledge to improve uh, society. In his case, he's doing 
some medical research and he's hoping that that may uh, help to cure, if not his own son, but some people with the same condition. So we are you know, doing something to make a difference also for others. You know, it seems very much ourselves when you're writing the thesis, but it should also benefit others. So what is research? In the broadest term, we do research whenever we gather information to answer a question that solves a problem. So if you turn it around, there has to be a problem. We have to identify a problem first, because otherwise it's going to be very, very difficult to write something and to come up with a conclusion. And it has to be original. And what do I mean by original? Uh, I like this clip. Okay. I just like told you in that moment, didn't I? No, no, no. It's just like we're not gonna make it out, okay? No, 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 I, I, I know what you're trying to do. Oh my, I am so mean. I was like, I'm, I'm sorry, I forget I just said that. I'm, that's dumb. And you know what I do when I feel completely unoriginal? Love, 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 love. I make a noise or I do something that no one has ever done before, and then I can feel unique again, even if it's only for like a second. So no one's ever done that? No, not in the spot, no. You just witnessed a completely original moment in human history. It's refreshing, you should try it. Oh, no, no. No, come on. No, I, no, I think that was good enough for the both of us. Come on. What are you, shy? This is your one opportunity to do something that no one has ever done before and that no one will copy again throughout human existence. And, and if nothing else, you'll be remembered as, as the one guy who ever did this. This one thing. How's that? Oh, I've done that one before. <laughs> so, uh, I gotta go bury this hamster before the dogs eat him. Wanna help? Mm -hmm. So, there's, uh, you know, a few uh, important things uh, with that. Is that original uh, has to be Define, you know, you have to check whether somebody has done it before. Uh, you have to check it carefully. And it also has to be, like she says, uh, you know, in, in our context, it doesn't have to be just somebody has not done this in this spot. It has to be worldwide new. Uh, and also, as opposed to, uh, to the guy, we need to try to take some chances of, of exposing ourselves because if we do the very simple thing we may do it very perfectly but in the end the grade will probably reflect that just like in gymnastics if you do a very low difficulty element you will not be rewarded the highest grade you cannot get 12 for saying that you walk back and forth here and measured something very very simple it has to be something of more complexity. So what I say here with this drawing is, uh, you know, you're here in your little DTU ship or, or, or sailing boat. And instead, you know, you can, of course, there's a boat on a road. There's some challenge in that. But don't take the paved road up by McDonald's and, and you know, take your easy uh, meal and, uh, and, and get to the goal. Try to sail into, you know, through inspiration and engagement, some curiosity and skeptical things, challenges, some revolution, take the path and then get to the goal at the end. And there's also an option here that may seem to lure you in, and that is the, you know, oh, this narrow road that leads to the goal. But one of the things with that is that avoid the narrow road that appears very direct because it may have very single failure modes. And that has to do with, oh yeah, well, if I only do this experiment that nobody has done before, uh, and maybe uh, hundreds have tried, but I'll do it correct. And in five months, even though people with a PhD and 20 years of experience couldn't do it, uh, you know, then you have a single mode of failure. Maybe there's something that you've overlooked that will stop you and then you don't have anything to fall back on. 
because it's the process that also gathers up information for your results and your writing. So when you're planning your project, you need to find a topic that is specific enough to let you master a reasonable amount of information in the time you have. Don't go too wide or too little. Question that topic and you find questions that catch your interest. Determine the kind of evidence your readers will expect you to offer in support of your answer. And determine whether you can find those data. There's no point in starting research on a topic until you know that you have a good chance of finding the data on it. There's a lot of things that would be great to do, but again, if it's too complex or, or too difficult, uh, it's better probably to say no before you get going. And also, don't do something that only intrigues you. It has to be interesting for others. So you need to do a problem identification. And, and here I'm very specific. It's not a problem formulation. Uh, if you formulate a problem, we can probably just sit down and formulate a lot of problems today. But to identify a problem can take a long time because it requires reading literature and seeing that is actually a real problem. So, I, you know, what are you writing about? What do you not know about it? And what do you want your reader to know and care about? So it has to be very specific so that you know kind of what would be the great plot to have in the end. Where do you want to go? Then under, as you go along, there may be things coming, new information coming in and you have to change it. But you should have some kind of idea of what would be the great plot. If I get this plot or if I get this result, then my thesis will be good. And then you do all the work to get there. So, and you also have to distinguish between a practical problem and a research problem. Uh, you know, to many researchers at all levels, uh, too many researchers at all levels write as if their only task is to answer a question that interests them alone. So you have a practical problem that should, mo you know, if you write for a company, they may have a, a practical problem or it may be some, some other things, but that should motivate a research question so that you can define a research problem and then you can get the research answer. And the research answer should be, uh, enable you to then solve the practical problem. And solving a problem for a company is not necessarily a research, it could quite often be just their development. So you have to keep in mind that you're not writing for the company, you're writing your thesis for your degree at DTU. And to be specific, what's the difference here? You know, because there's a nuance difference, because if you solve a practical problem, you will get an answer and you can get a lot of answers, but it, they may be very, very specific, specific and may not be so useful for other people in the long run. Engineering company often answers problem because they're asked for specific problems by a customer and that's what they do. But when we do research, can be used to answer many future practical questions provided that the problem has been properly identified and the plots have been correct, uh, have the correct parameters on the x-axis and the y-axis. What do I mean by that? Well, if we look at something uh, very carefully, we have to look at it from many angles uh, and, and over a longer time and possibly then, uh, you know, because uh, answer would be somebody asking for, uh, you know, an equivalence ratio of three and uh, a speed of 100, what happens and they go to this. But what if they then ask for something here, so instead of, if we have done the research, we can give them a fairly good estimate right away instead of setting out to find that particular point that is missing. So if we point a graph, that is also some way of doing a sensitivity analysis to see how the trend is and to make predictions. So when you get to, when you've done and, and get the results, you're going to write a report and you have a new interesting information and you have important practical problem and you have answered important question. And the report structure, 
uh, people always ask about a template. To me, a template for a thesis ex is extremely, extremely easy. It is an abstract, you know, it's a front page. You have an abstract. Then there's an introduction, that's chapter one. Uh, chapter two is experimental setup or numerical method, data collection scheme, theoretical derivations. And number three, which is big, is results. And that's where you need to start, you know, along with, with this. But if you ha don't have the results, all of these other things that are before and after are going to be extremely difficult to write and balance off. And then you have discussions and perspectives and a conclusion and possibly some future work and references. Chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that's a very standard and will always work. And then you have references. And here it's important to look at citations to get the most current papers. Citations means people who have referred to that article. So if you have a paper from 1982, it may have a lot of citations will, which will bring you forward in time. Because if you just look at the references, that will bring you further and further back in time until you get back to the 1700s if you do really thorough research or somebody has done work on it for so long. But try also to look at the citations so you get up to what is happening in April and May 2015 uh, to stay current. When you do write, there are some key writing tips. One is topic sentence. A topic sentence is the first sentence in a paragraph. And, the to and there's a link here. And that topic sentence should inform the reader, you know, in, in a direct way, what is this paragraph about? Because if I want to speed read, I, could read the first, I should be able to read the first sentence and sort of see, okay, this paragraph, this is key, I have this information. Because otherwise, if you take them all, you know, if, if you have seven different things in one paragraph, it may also be very difficult to follow your logic. Use transition words, you know, as a result, therefore, uh, consequently, uh, you know, to drive the logic of your writing, both within a paragraph, but also between paragraphs. There should be no surprises in the text. You're not writing a crime novel. Tell everybody on the, in the first page, you know, which, or second page, which is the abstract, who, the, who was the murderer. There's no point in hiding it. They are interested in knowing exactly what you did and what you find. The report goes in detail to explain them that, but the abstract is where they want to figure out whether they want to read more. So tell them who killed whom, you know, was it uh, the professor in the billiard room with a pistol, if you played Cluedo or Clue. Uh, and think of who your audience is. And it's not your supervisor, it's not just the external reader, it's a more general audience of somebody at your level with some previous knowledge on the thing, if you go too much in detail, too simplistic, you'll bore people, you may even offend people because they're like, why am I reading this? Do they think I don't know this? This is, you know, do they think I'm stupid? Uh, so that, and if it's too difficult, people would not be able to follow and then does not appreciate uh, what you've done. And on, on simple things, also get the units and the format right and, and, and use of formulas. Here is something from NIST, uh, a link on, on how to do units and, uh, and writing them in the text and, and displaying it. Create clear figures and figures with a caption. This is a figure caption, this is the text that goes with it. And every figure should be introduced in the text. So if you get to it, that happened for a student of my recently, he said, oh, I feel that I don't really properly introduce all of my figures in the text. And I say, well, possibly you have too many figures because they're not becoming relevant. They're becoming irrelevant for the logic in the text. So if you have just figures there because you have them, you can put them in an the appendix or maybe you can combine them to a master plot that makes them relevant. And it should be a number, but it is also a text. So if people, again, want to speed read, they could look at the figure and get the information just by looking at the figures. 
So when it comes to words of wisdom and followed by some practical information, uh, this is all, and, and some of the previous is also by a book, uh, Craft of Research, in a very small print from Amazon. Uh, it may be uh, worthwhile, uh, about $10 it costs. I, and don't quote me on this, but sometimes you can find these uh, type of PDFs uh, if you Google uh, closely. I don't know. Uh, you know, words of wisdom from people that have written before. You will struggle with your project if you do not know what readers look for in a final report. Go in the archives, look at previous reports. What do they look like? What was a good report? Ask some friends you have. Do you have a previous report? Ask uh, your supervisor. Do you have a report from a previous student that I can look at? Uh, and you should not think, you should think of your project not as solitary work, but as conversation with sources whose work you read and with those who will in turn read your work. So that is referencing and putting it in context. And no place is filled with imag more imaginary voices than a library or a lab. I.e., don't dig a hole and be just yourself. Discuss with your friends, discuss with your supervisor, uh, ask librarians uh, for help, uh, Bring in, uh, you know, friends, even if they're, you know, if, if your fri friend is writing in, in uh, uh, a DTU compute, you will most likely have some similar op type of obstacles and experiences. So you can share across. It doesn't have to be topic specific. But don't think that, oh, I'm the only one in this situation. Uh, and then sometimes new data alone are enough to interest the right readers. But if you hope to write something that is really good, it's not, you know, very few can just have, this is the plot and I write four th pages and that's golden. That could happen if you had some result that was Nobel Prize worthy. Unfortunately for civil engineering, the number of uh, Nobel Prizes are, are very low in, in our field. Uh, so, so, so it has to be elaborated on. Uh, and so don't think that one single result will, will solve all of it. And if a writer asks no specific question worth asking, he, she cannot offer a specific answer worth supporting. So again, you have to have the story straight and identify the problem. Uh, you cannot use specific ideas, that is plagiarism. But what you can do is you can always, again, look for inspiration in papers and assimilate to their logic. People's logic and, and the way things have been done, you know, a, me a research method can always be copied as long as you get new results. And it's very smart to look at what others have done because then you again secure yourself against a single failure mode because you have something that people have done and it's known to work whether it's experiments or numerical methods. Uh, and it's not research when you uncritically summarize another person's work. So again, try to move on from this uh, classic learning we had in, uh, in grammar school about summarize a novel or summarize some work to referencing. At the master's level, you're supposed to reference. You're supposed to be aware of what others have done and put yourself in context to that and refer to it instead of reiterate what they have done. It can be a very uh, short sentence. Peterson and uh, his co-workers showed that the beam will fail at such and such loading, parentheses, a number, and that supports your argument. Uh, however, my result shows, and then you have an argument going. You don't have to write uh, or paraphrase their whole paper and use their figures to get there. Just say it's been done. The interested reader can go and find it themselves. And beginners typically offer too little evidence. They think they prove a claim with one, question, uh, one uh, quotation, one number, or one personal experience. And that's the one very important thing. An example is not evidence, even though journalists think so. It's very, you know, we have to think of, in, in a journalist view, point of view, they call up an expert and they, if, if the person is not even an expert, they'll name them to become an expert so that they can do their job easily. 
and say, oh, I found an expert who says this. And then they say, yep, that's, that's solved. And then everybody reads it, and it can take a long time to, to clean that up. For us, we need more than just an example or more than just somebody's statement, uh, because that could be completely causal instead of uh, supported uh, information. You also have to manage the unavoidable problem of inexperience. For most of you, it's going to be the first and only time you write a master thesis. Accept that. You know, that's just the way it is. Uh, and you'll all be anxious when you start, and it's new and it's difficult. But know that uncertainty and anxiety are natural and inevitable. Those feelings do not signal incompetence, only inexperience. Something we've not done before is new, and it's not necessarily that, oh, I don't, I'm not good at this. It's just that you haven't done it. So get control over your topic by writing along. Don't write your thesis in the last two weeks. I'll get back to that. Break the task into manage, manageable steps. Count on your advisors to understand your struggles. We want you to succeed, and then you can expect our help. And you should expect our help, and you should really uh, ask us uh, for, your, for our help. Set realistic goals. And most important, recognize the struggle for what it is. It's a learning experience. You're still in training. And if you continue uh, in school, you'll do a PhD, and you're still in training. So accept that. And, and, and the moment you accept that, it's easier to go down instead of saying, oh, I should know this. No, it's the first time. So how do we proceed with this? Uh, the master's thesis is the final assignment of the master's uh, course at ETU. And what does it mean to be the final? That means that you should, before it was written that you had to have at least 55 ECTS points. Now it is that you ha it has your final assignment, meaning that you can take a course in parallel with it, but you cannot uh, start it before you're at the very end of uh, your coursework. And then you find the subject area of interest. Uh, in on CampusNet, uh, you can find we put things in the folder for the civil engineering where I'm writing the messages to you in that CampusNet group. There are project catalogs. But the different sections at DTU Civil Engineering also have their project catalogs that are more or less updated, but give you an idea of what's, uh, what people are doing. And then you contact the supervisor within that area of research. It could be DTU Civil Engineering, mechanical, management, uh, environmental, uh, space, what, you know, it could be any. And discuss with the prospective supervisor if collaboration with a company is relevant. Or if you work in a company, you can go that way and say, I want to work, do something there. And then you contact a DTU supervisor. Either way, you always need to have a DTU supervisor. So finding your project is a process. So in my case, if you, you know, I'm interested in fire safety. So if you were, were to be interested in fire safety, you could say, oh, I'm interested in fire safety. Ah. Oh, there's a guy, I took a class with him uh, or her, and say, oh, yeah, this guy, I wonder what he's doing. And then you can go into DTU orbit or something and look what I'm doing, a lot of different things. Uh, and then they say, oh, this, this one uh, is what I'm interested in. Ah, uh, material flammability in microgravity. Yeah, that that's really sounds interesting. And I saw this guy on the front of the DTU newspaper, that project, I want to be part of that. And then you go, it's like, uh, talk with me and you say, oh, well, let me read a, a, a few things because the picture was really cool and the title sounded cool, but I don't know really, you know, is this really something that I'm interested in uh, to do? So maybe took a, take a look at the papers that I have written or that seem relevant. And then you go back in and because typically within that sphere, do you, you're going to be working on a very small part of that again. And, and that's how it goes, you know, so it goes from very global, specific, back and forth into identify a small problem. 
And this is thanks to uh, Jakob Berg Johansson, a former student who, who also uh, helped with this. So how do you select the supervisor? You know, most of us want a great supervisor, so why not take one that you think that you like or that you know that you like from courses or previous projects, bachelors, so on and so forth. You know, good teachers, uh, professors that made an interesting talk, interesting research area. But keep in mind that a good teacher may not necessarily be a good researcher, uh, you know, because scholastic aptitude and research aptitude are two different things. Uh, you know, look at their homepage, look into their research, their publications, their research group, their previous uh, supervision, uh, if this uh, works. Um, you know, then you can go in and, and you see uh, DTU uh, here and it says publication, project, activity, CV, uh, DTU news. You can see what's going on with the supervisor to see whether they, what they have going uh, seems to be interesting or whether that was something that was just a perception on your side. And how do you approach a potential supervisor? Well, write an email, knock on their door, you know, it's a dating process and uh, and uh, try to figure out the game, but it's not very difficult. Just open your mouth or, or, or write. But when you write an email, show that you have thought something about it. Don't come in, write to 10 people like, I need to write a thesis and I should preferably work starting tomorrow. <laughs> Puts an intervenous uh, thesis into here so that I could survive for the next half year on my SU. You no, know, be proactive, be, be inspired. You know, tell them who you are and where you know the supervisor from, which courses have you taken and how did, you, how did it approximately go? What do you, wa what do, uh, you want and, uh, to do and why do you ask this supervisor, uh, this supervisor, uh, yeah, some, uh, the project start, uh, what kind of uh, bachelor thesis did you write, what kind of special course have you taken? You know, possibly ask, do you have available projects or suggestions? Can we meet? It's okay to shop around, but not too much and do not skip the project in the last moment. That's very bad for you, but it's also bad for the supervisor because they may do some planning uh, maybe some uh, arrangements, uh, financially uh, preparing for things. Uh, so it's not great to two days before and say, oh, actually I talked with five people and now I wasted their time and I decided this guy uh, the last minute. You know, be open about, you know, you can be open that, I'm, uh, that you're looking, but at some point uh, try to narrow it down. And that's why, as we will get back to, that we have certain deadlines for this process. Do diligence, you know, do the research for the project selection. Is the project a part of a larger research project? That's typically a plus. Uh, is it possible to be co-supervised by a PhD student? That's typically very good because then you have somebody to, to work with, you know, directly. Is it realistic to write a scientific article? That could be that you write something and go to a conference. That's a great experience. It's also fun. It's also a good way to see a part of the world typically by somebody paying for you to go to Korea or San Francisco or wherever the conference may be. What kind of supervision can you expect? You know, be direct. It's like, are you too busy? Are you available? Can I get supervision from you? How much? Uh, how many students do the supervisor have? If, he's, if he has 42, being number 43 may not be so ideal. Uh, you know, can you get some articles describing the project background? Are, the necessary data in place and can you get them? Are there experimental rig and the needed equipment in material in place? You know, if you're going to do experiments, ask to come and see the lab, see what's going on. Sometimes you will also there see like, ah, that kind of, uh, th that looks not like me. You know, the more you get into it, you, you'll sort of get a feel for, for what is you and what is not you. Does the ETU have the needed program licenses if you're doing numerical work? Uh, it's very important because it can take a long time or they can be exceedingly uh, expensive. And how much manual work is uh, expected? As I said, it's the report that matters. So if you're going to go out and 
create 267 beams uh, that takes you four and a half months to do, uh, where, where, how are you going to have time to write? You know, you're not the labor. We have support by technical assistant personnel that should be able to support you in building things uh, in general. So expect that and check that there are resources for that, both financially and uh, in, in, in ours. Uh, and you can always also, if you plan ahead, you can write your thesis abroad. Probably a third of the students that I've supervised have written uh, theses in Australia, UK, the US, uh, Norway. Uh, so it is possible, but it takes uh, typically a bit more planning. So what's the timeline for all of this? Well, clock is ticking. Uh, if you're going to write in the fall, you know, because about three to six months before starting the project, think about topics that you find interesting. Do you want to write with a company? And typically no later than three months before anticipated starting date, which is now with the new rules, 1st of August. So that means about this time frame uh, that you should establish contact with a relevant supervisor. And then about one to two months before anticipated starting date, start working on the project formulation. Find the starting date with your supervisor, you know. But now, the new DTO rules about starting dates, it's the first working day of January or the first working day of August. So it's very simple uh, in that sense. And if you have activities that are in parallel, you can get an extension, but those are by default the starting dates and that will by default give you an end date because there's no vacation uh, during uh, the thing. If you write a 5 ECTS point course, you will uh, write. If you write uh, for 30 points, it's five months. If you write two, 32 and a half uh, points, it's five and a half months. And if you write uh, 35 points, which are the three options, you write for six months. And the system will automatically give you the end date. So, so there's no fixing around on that. And I ex expect you to go in and read the study database on the things, the constraints, the, le you know, the, the constraints of your education that are given by DTU for it. And then about one month before the anticipated starting date, Submit the signed project registration form electronically and it's written on the web page. The form is, is available and Marianne is very happy to receive them and she's also very happy to receive them when they're ready and in due time because she cannot process 60 forms in one day and especially not the day uh, before August 1st because she may be on vacation. Uh, so keep in mind that one thing is your planning, but it's also you're using a system that needs to assist you. So uh, the link is here. The form has to be completed and approved before you start your project. You cannot start your project before the project has been approved. And all of them go through me or through Christian, where we look whether you know, particularly some of the details Mariana look at, uh, techni uh, technical things, uh, writing in English, which is mandatory, and, uh, and all of uh, some other things, uh, titles and so on and so forth. And Kristen and I try to look at uh, the, prob uh, the problem identification to see whether this makes sense. And technically what we most look at is whether it falls within the education you're in because we trust your supervisors to define a, pro, you know, a proper project. But sometimes it happens that somebody is like, well, I want to write in the D2 environmental engineering about bird watching in the Fulesö. And it was like, well, but you're getting a degree in, in civil engineering. I don't think that topic will re really fit uh, with us giving, granting you a degree. So, so do all of these things, no vacation, English, and describe it in detail, you know, tell us whether it's going to be experimental, numerical or theoretical, because one thing, you know, telling us, but 
if you don't know the day you start, whether it's going to be numerical or experimental, that's going to delay your process. <coughs> you know, and the project process, learn about the topic, literature search, start a, start a report from day one. You know, as a reference manager, I, sorry, uh, I, if you don't know how to use a reference manager, uh, the DTU library has courses on how to use this. It's very, very beneficial to, uh, to use this. Uh, write the introduction and problem statement very early. And as you can find in the study database, at, at the latest three weeks after the project start, technically the rule says that your project statement should be, part, as it was written after a month, should be included in your thesis. And this is for, you know, you can say, oh, what is this, another constraint? But this is actually, should be for your benefit, because that can tell the external reader, the sensor, whether the project was poorly defined and, and took you through turns and twists that were making it very difficult for you to work. So, so it can, you know, help you in, in showing what you were told that you should do and what you've actually done. And do not start coding, welding, mixing, experimenting before your problem statement is clearly written because then you'll just do a lot of experiment, a lot of manual work and not necessarily know whether it's going to pay off. And the project completion, it'll be ups and downs. Uh, you'll have a good meeting and then afterwards, uh, or you prepare for a meeting, you have the meeting and then the supervisor tells you that, yeah, that doesn't work. And then you go back and you go up and up and then and then your PhD defense or uh, your master's defense in this case. And then you realize you just gave a 20 minute talk uh, of three, you know, six months or five months of work. And, uh, and there were only three plots presented that was actually not just introduction and pictures that you found related to the topic. And you feel maybe, uh, but it is uh, important uh, to keep in mind there will be ups and downs, so just prepare, prepare for it and accept it. And there's a key thing, is the importance of getting started. And that is, we'll all be very resistant to doing something that we haven't done before. And we'll listen and the supervisor tells you, get started, and you say, nah. And then you consider it, and this is the buy-in. And then you get to the willing to do, doing, and glad you did, and you may continue to do. But it's you are in the center of this. We can try to, to help you, but we will not drag you in the ears to do your thesis as supervisors. Uh, you're, you know, adults and are expected to take care of this yourself. But the earlier you start, the better it is. Don't do this classic you know, this is the student knowledge and this is the project timeline in percent. Don't do this studying for exam thing that where you, the day before the exam, you get all the knowledge you have and you get, you know, possibly you get the good results. <coughs> but in this case, try to do a different trajectory because so that you get to a high knowledge as quick as possible. Because refining this knowledge will be, take some time but the key is also, is this line here, this is the supervisor buy-in zone. Until you get to a certain level of knowledge and information, it's not going to be that interesting for your supervisor because they probably done similar projects before and they're interested in something that can lead to a publication, that can lead to new knowledge. So you have to uh, try to get to that point. And the reward is, if you get to that point, you get longer time to discuss with your supervisor and you can for sure expect to get more and more of his or her time to discuss the project. And a very important thing to remember, the grade is solely based on your written work, the report. No matter how nice you are, how much data you gather, how much manual work you've done, it's the documentation and written presentation uh, of all that counts. And in the end, good planning gives a good result. Uh, so uh, 
that was all that, uh, that I had. Uh, we will um, take uh, questions. Uh, Marianne is here. Also, uh, Per Goldman may or may not be here for, for a few minutes. If you don't know Per, he's the, the Institute student and the, the study council, the head of the study council at the DTU Bygg, and, and also Christian in the back. Uh, it has been recorded, we'll share the slides, so hopefully some of those details uh, can, uh, can be used. And if you have further questions, uh, don't hesitate to contact us. And as a last thing that I would say is obviously good luck in the process, prepare well. But also, if you were to have a problem during the thesis that you feel is unfair, something is unfair, we are also there for you then. Contact us to discuss, do you need extra time? Is something going on in your personal life or is something going on, something breaking down in, uh, in the lab where you need extra time or you need at least somebody to talk with? Come and talk with us. And, but don't wait until two days before the thesis is due because then it's very tough for us to justify that you as a project leader of your master thesis have planned it. We, you know, we're not there to sign off something and, and vouch you out. Uh, we're there to assist you. So if you see something that may cause problems, do contact us and we'll do the best to steer you in to a successful completion. So good luck.